Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Markets in a holding pattern ahead of U.S. inflation data, which could influence the Federal Reserve's next move. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warns the U.S. economy is not out of the woods, saying a recession isn't off the table, adding that the Fed should wait before cutting interest rates. Plus, the UK's January labour market data will be closely watched by the Bank of England, with regular pay growth likely to show signs of stickiness. Will it move the dial for the BOE? We will bring you analysis throughout the morning. Let's check in on these markets then. After some modest losses across European and US stocks yesterday, futures looking a little brighter than today as we lead up to the wage data here in the UK. And then, of course, the data print arguably of the week when it comes to CPI out of the US and whether indeed it does change the narrative for the Fed. Of course, Jay Powell last week in testimony suggesting that they are getting closer on the FOMC to a point where they do have that confidence to cut rates. They're not there yet, but will the data get them a little bit closer when it crosses today? Or will it surprise the downside and cause some fluctuations across these markets? Again, European futures looking to gain to six tenths of a percent after the modest losses yesterday. FTSE 100 futures pointing to seven. 1,730, currently up eight tenths of a percent as we look to that labour data and whether or not it moves the dial for the Bank of England. Currently, markets pricing in the rate cut from the BOE in August after the ECB and the Fed. S&P futures at 5,200, so back above that 5,200 level, gains of four tenths of a percent again after the modest losses of yesterday. NASDAQ futures pointing higher by six tenths, seven tenths of a percent at 18,337. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. We are, of course, keeping an eye on the currency space, the pound in focus for us today, of course, as we look ahead to that labour data and the jobs data out of the UK. 4.09 on the benchmark US 10 years. We count down to the CPI and inflation print out of the US. Not a lot of movement so far at the back end of US Treasuries. The pound at 128, of course, year to date, one of the best performing currencies, the pound. We'll see if that changes that narrative later today on the labour market data. Bitcoin had crossed above 72,000 yesterday, a fresh record, of course, currently at 71,914 as the money flows into those ETFs just continue uh, for Bitcoin. Currently down three tenths of a percent in the session. Iron ore, we saw the biggest drop since 2022, almost a drop of 7% yesterday in the session on concerns of a Lack of fiscal stimulus coming out of China. Also, a build up of stockpiles as well at Chinese ports. Currently at 108 per ton for iron ore, up eight tenths of a percent in the session. Talking of China, let's cross over to Asia now, where Avril Hong is standing by in Hong Kong, in Singapore, I should say. Um, Avril, what is what is standing out to you across these markets in Asia? Yeah, what's standing out is the Chinese equities recovery. The CSI 300, the Hang Seng, both extending gains from yesterday. The Hang Seng Tech, we've seen the Chinese tech's names. They've been gaining ground for three straight days. Even the developers listed in Hong Kong are on the move. And it seems like investors are for now shrugging off an underwhelming NPC as well as woes in the property sector. Worth noting, when we talk about the Hang Seng Tech, it's risen 20% from its January lows. We'll see how it finishes the day, but let's flip the board because it's still worth talking about what we see in the real estate sector in China. We've been keeping a very close watch on China Vanka. It's seen as one of the more resilient developers because of state backing, because of its investment grade credit quality uh, rating, I should say. And we're seeing today Moody's uh, cutting it to junk territory and Chinese lenders reportedly reluctant to lend to it or provide financial assistance <clears throat> because they want to see more collateral before they sign off on an offshore loan. So that is one thing that we're keeping a close eye on in Chinese markets. Let's flip the board because we also want to zero in on what we're seeing on the yen today. The BOJ governor uh, talking about how he sees weakness in consumption that prompts some sectors of the market to maybe uh, pair back some of their bets that we're going to see an imminent move from the BOJ next week or next month and the yen weakened versus the green bag but flip the board because if you take a look at how it's been faring since the start of the month we've really seen dollar yen pull down below from the 150 level that's really putting pressure on Japanese equities uh, we're still seeing that JGBs are feeling the pressure from what we're going to get from the BOJ. Uh, of course, there's not much risk appetite in the region today as well because we're turning our attention to the US CPI. Tom. 
OK, Avril Hong on the changing fortunes for Japanese equities, at least for now, of course, after a very solid run year to date. Let's get you some breaking news in terms of the earnings story then. Generally, of course, the Italian insurance giant coming out with details around the full year and fourth quarter. Full year across the board. This is a beat coming through from Generali. Full year net income, 3.75 billion euros. The estimates had been for 3.56 billion. So it's a beat on the full year net income for Generali. Operating profit on a full year basis as well. Also a beat coming in at 6.88 billion euros. The estimates had been for 6.81 billion euros. And the full year dividend per share, the estimates had been for 1 euro 24. They've come out with a full year dividend per share of 128. Again, a beat across the board, it seems, for Generali, full year. And on the fourth quarter basis as well, there had been some concern that maybe the fourth quarter would be a little softer. Fourth quarter net income, though, beating solidly 925 million euros. The estimates had been for 733 million euros year to date. In fact, over the last 12 months, this stock is up 33%. We're going to be speaking, I will be speaking to Generali's CEO and managing director, Philip Donnet, next hour. So stay tuned for that conversation, the details, of course, and the reaction to those earnings. We are counting down, of course, to the latest inflation data coming out of the U.S. The closely watched numbers will give investors further clues, they will hope, on the Fed's policy path. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Jill Desis then for the preview. Jill, what are you going to be watching for when it comes to the February CPI numbers later today? Well, Tom, I think a lot to look out for in these February CPI numbers. Of course, as you remember, January was hotter than expected. I think we'll be looking for a bit of a cooling off and at least the core inflation numbers. Bloomberg Economics is thinking, um, you know, uh, particularly um, car prices probably contributing to that being a little bit lighter. I think that's ultimately what the market would be looking for, because as you know, um, you know, we'd like to see continued signs. The market would like to see continued signs of sort of a, a, a gradual cooling off in inflation. Not sure whether we're going to get that or not. Uh, the other thing that I'm looking out for in these numbers is whether we get any um, sort of clarity on uh, the stickiness of housing inflation in particular. If you remember, there was uh, sort of a weird spike in one of the sub-indexes in the January figure that um, was catching a lot of attention, um, specifically as it related to owner's equivalent rent. We later got um, some information from the Labor, uh, Labor Bureau saying, um, you know, there were some changes in how we weighted some things, and that's what contributed there. But uh, you know, obviously, I think uh, there's, um, you know, a lot of ongoing concern about whether there's sort of that continued stickiness in housing inflation. Uh, we'll have to see whether that underlying gauge gives us any more clarity. But of course, as you know, Tom, you know, even if we're not expecting any kind of interest rate cut uh, next week from from the FOMC, just the fact that we've got a meeting coming so soon after this print, I think, is why it's all eyes on what happens with February CPI right now. Yeah, absolutely. We are, of course, building up to that data point. Meanwhile, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan's uh, CEO, of course, weighing in with his views on the U.S. economy, suggesting that he is a little bit more concerned maybe than others are about the risks of, of a recession in the U.S. What's he been saying? Yeah, it was interesting to hear from Jamie Dimon. So essentially saying, look, while everyone else is pricing in this idea of a risk of, um, you know, 70 to 80 percent chance of a or rather um, 70, 80 percent chance of a soft landing, he said he actually sees the odds, it's, uh, it, um, you know, significantly lower than that, maybe half of that. Um, so, you know, sort of raising the alarm a little bit on the fact that, you know, despite some of the recent data that we've had, it's like, you know, maybe we still are at risk of recession. Jill, I'm going to interrupt you at this point because we yes. have a redhead crossing the terminal right now, the Bank of Japan said to mull a March hike with the outcome too close to call. That is the redhead across the terminal right now, checking in on US dollar JPY, the Japanese yen currently in 147. So pairing some of the weakness that had come through in the session, currently just down three tenths of a percent. Looking at Japanese 10 year yields, currently at 0.77 as well. Marginal move in the yield picture. The Japanese yen again, currently at 147.40 on the back of this redhead, crossing the terminal right now, that the Bank of Japan is said to be mulling a March hike with the outcome still too close to call. We've been hearing from, of course, the BOJ Governor Ueda talking about the economy recovering generally, even as there are pockets of, of weakness in consumption. A couple of the lines crossed as he gave testimony earlier today. But again, reporting from Bloomberg then that the BOJ then is looking potentially at that March hike, ending negative rates as soon as next 
week. We'll bring you more details, of course, as we get it on this unfolding story. We'll keep across the Japanese assets as well. Jill, let's get back to you then on the details from uh, JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon, of course. I was interrupting you to break that redhead. But the importance, of course, in terms of how he's thinking about this economy, but also his views on the interest rate view and what the Fed should be doing. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's certainly um, he's saying that they need more data to ultimately make some of these decisions. I agree there. I think that, you know, that's where the February CPI statistics ultimately come into play. Um, because as you know, Tom, when we were looking through some of that labor data from Friday, some, you know, interesting, uh, you know, s s signals in there. We saw, um, you know, overall that headline uh, non-farm payroll report figure was still pretty strong. But we did see that slight uptick in the unemployment rate. We did see some underlying um, wage data data that was maybe more favorable to this idea of a gradual cooling off in the market. I think ultimately, you know, what the, the case that Jamie Dimon is making is, is certainly that, you know, that idea that that data needs to be a significant calculation here. As the Fed goes forward, do they have enough information yet uh, to make a call on rates? Uh, not yet, but we'll ultimately see where this next CPI print leaves us. And then I think all eyes are then obviously pivoting toward what's going to be happening uh, with that next FOMC meeting next week. Where are we going to hear from Powell on the Fed's calculus for when they might start cutting interest rates. Traders obviously think that's going to be June at this point. Um, does that still hold? Do they move something up a little bit earlier? It's all about timing, Tom. OK, Bloomberg's Jill Deesis, thank you very much indeed. And when we think about the relative resilience, of course, of the US economy, we think about fiscal stimulus and talking about fiscal stimulus. Uh, we have to think about the budget, of course, and budget plans. US President Joe Biden unveiling a $7.3 trillion fiscal 2025 budget proposal that would deliver more services, middle class tax breaks and price controls. It would be funded through higher taxes on the wealthy and corporations. Let's get the details then from Bloomberg anchor Kriti Gupta, who's been watching this for us. Kriti, what is standing out to you? What is in this package? of proposals, 7.2 trillion. Yeah, Tom, uh, this is really coming down to one question, one question only. How do you get that deficit, the ballooning yeah. deficit over the next decade under control? To, uh, a forecast, by the way, that the Biden administration is something like, like $1.6 trillion per year. Now, this plan is a, 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 a supposed to address about $3 trillion of that deficit over an entire decade. But do the math there. $1.6 trillion per year over the next decade. $3 trillion is only a small drop in the bucket in terms of the way to go. Biden's kind of approach to this is to tax the wealthy, to tax corporations, and to do so, in a way that does it on multiple levels. You've got the billionaires tax. You've got anyone making above 400000 You've also got, not to mention, corporations. Anyone who's getting a lot more revenue from abroad, including, by the way, European corporations that then get a lot of their revenue from the United States, all of that is getting taxed and feeding that, or trying to at least stem the blood and stem the hemorrhaging that you are seeing out of the Biden budget. That being said, you are seeing a lot of pushback from the GOP on this. And this is where Biden's budget is more crucial because although the really only big major change between now and the last budget he had was a kind of a 1% increase on defense spending, a much smaller increase than some of his peers around the world are posting when it comes to that GDP. The GOP is saying even that is too much spending. The kind of support that he wants to give the middle class, lower income tax uh, kind of breaks aren't actually going to be helpful for the long term. The GOP instead saying, what about that consumer resilience? What about mm. that consumer growth? But Tom, at the mm. end of the day, you'll remember better than anyone, back in the fall of 2023, remember that big sell-off we had in the long end of the curve? A lot of that was centered around concerns around the fiscal deficit. This is why it matters for the European audience, because if you can't get that deficit under control, the entire world suffers. Okay, well, I was going to ask, ask you to kind of sideline my cynicism because I look at this and then I think about how this is actually going to be implemented, if, in, if at yeah. all, and what parts of this budget will actually end up being implemented. Uh, it seems uh, very limited parts. We've run out of time. I wanted to get your reaction to that. Uh, but you are pointing out that this is also a bit of, a, bit of an election ploy, of course, as we build up to November. Uh, so a, a little bit of architecture going in in terms of the views of the Biden administration in terms of what their priorities are when it comes to this economy. Uh, Chrissy Gupta, thank you very much indeed, of course. Bloomberg anchor with the details of that proposed budget coming through from the Biden administration. Let's check in on what else is on the docket then for you today. Of course, we have in the UK the jobs data, 7 a.m. So 45 minutes time. You've been watching that if you have a view on the Bank of England. Currently, markets and traders pricing in a cut not until August for the BOE. But will the data today in terms of wages change that view? Average weekly earnings growth seems slowing from 5.8% to 5.7%. The unemployment rate seeing coming in at 3.8%. 8 a.m. Von der Leyen.
of the European Union, of course, will be speaking in the European Parliament, 8 a.m. UK time, to discuss up the upcoming Leaders' Summit. There's a lot, of course, on the agenda. Ukraine and support Ukraine will be part of that mix, of course, as they consider, of course, the budget challenges of Brussels. And at 1.30 p.m. UK time, we're going to get that U.S. CPI print then. Expectations that core will come in at around 3.7%, of course, following on from Jay Powell's comments and testimony last week where he signalled and suggested they were getting slightly closer. They need more confidence on the data front. They are getting closer to being able to cut interest rates. Will the data today give Jay Powell and team on the FMC that confidence to get a clearer view on when that first cut comes? Now, coming up. Ukraine scrambles to build war fortifications as the CIA warns momentum on the battlefield is shifting in Russia's favour. We get the details on that story. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, a Bloomberg scoop around the thinking of the BOJ. They are getting closer to deciding whether or not to hike rates for the first time since 2007 next week. It does sound like it is on the wire for the BOJ. They are waiting for wage data coming through on Friday to make the final decision. Currently, it is too close to call. If they do hold next week, according to Bloomberg reporting, they are considering a hawkish hold, signalling that a hike will be coming even if they do hold next week. Again, they are edging closer to raising interest rates. That is the top line. Whether they do it in March or April, the consensus seems to be building that a hike is coming, a move out of negative rates then for the BOJ, currently checking on the yen, currently at 147.52, still softer in the session against the US dollar by four tenths of a percent. We will keep across this story for you, of course. The governor of the Bank of Japan speaking earlier, saying he is seeing relative resilience in terms of the economy of Japan. The economy is recovering, even as he sees pockets of weakness in consumption. Let's switch focus now to the geopolitics of Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine is racing to complete 2,000 kilometres of defensive fortifications as Kyiv runs low on ammunition and Russian forces go on the offensive. This as US intelligence agencies warn senators that the deadlock in Ukraine is shifting the momentum in Moscow's favour. Let's get more then from Bloomberg's Bill Ferries, who has the details for us. Bill, what has President Zelensky been saying about Ukraine's effort then to bolster their defences? Well, that's right. You mentioned the uh, 2,000 kilometres of defensive fortifications. President Zelensky says that uh, his government and military is working to complete that in a timely manner. It looks like they've had to accelerate some of that work. The goal real, really here is to, uh, is to slow down any additional Russian advances. They've already, uh, Ukraine has already lost some territory this year. They want to keep that to a minimum and trying to build this out while they can. But they have also warned about the, the threat that the uh, shortages of ammunition pose to them as this war is now fully into its third year. And what has U.S. intelligence been saying about their views as they weigh up the data, they weigh up the lines coming through, they weigh up the intelligence in terms of where the standing is in this conflict? Well, you had the top U.S. intelligence chiefs on Capitol Hill talking to senators about the worldwide threats. A lot of that was focused on Ukraine. They have said that uh, the CIA director, Bill Burns, for instance, said that uh, without this Im improvement or uh, additional Western military help, that uh, Russia will likely make significant gains uh, this year on the battlefield. You remember a year ago we were talking about a promised Ukrainian offensive. Russia was on the defense uh, the offensive then. We're now in a reverse situation. They said that Russia appears to have the momentum in this battle, and that will continue unless Western allies, particularly the U.S., step up. OK, Bloomberg's Bill Ferries with the details there in terms of what the intelligence agencies have been saying about the fate of Ukraine and the prospects, of course. Thank you very much indeed for the details, Bill. Now to Haiti, where the unelected Prime Minister, Errol Henry, has resigned as violence escalates across 
the Caribbean country. According to the president of Guyana, the Transitional Council in Haiti will appoint an interim leader as they prepare for elections following weeks of violence. The U.S. has committed a further $100 million for peacekeepers in Haiti. Former Credit Suisse chief executive Tijen Tiem has signalled his intention to run for president in Ivory Coast. The 61-year-old former banker convincingly won the leadership of the country's Democratic Party at a Congress last year and told Le Monde newspaper that he will seek the party's nomination to run for president. Elections are set for October of next year. There is plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Let's bring you up to date with the lines crossing on the BOJ. Then Bloomberg reporting, according to sources, they are getting closer to making a decision as to whether or not to hike for the first time since 2007, either next week, of course, in the month of March or in April. Either way, it's too close to call right now. They're going to be looking at the wage negotiation detail that comes out on Friday. That's going to be really, really consequential in terms of thinking of the Bank of Japan. And they may send a hike signal. If they do hold in March, they may send a hike signal. So it would likely to be a hawkish hold if a hold comes through again. They are split, it seems. They are on the line, on the wire, when it comes to the decision as to whether to hike in March or in April. And again, the wage data will be consequential. They're going to judge if pay figures will be enough for the March move. Those data and that detail expected to come through on Friday. They are currently split on March or April. It is too close to call. The Japanese yen currently trading at 147.44, down three-tenths of a percent against the U.S. dollar after the strength that has come through, of course, would be the first hike for this Bank of Japan since 2007, moving out of negative territory. Now, on to some of the other top stories we are following this Tuesday. On to the tech space, and Oracle shares have surged in late trade after it reported a spike in bookings attributed to its cloud computing business. Revenue from the cloud division jumped 25%. In the last quarter, slightly ahead of estimates, Oracle is focused on expanding its cloud infrastructure business to compete with the likes of Amazon, Microsoft and Alphabet. Some of those names, of course, within the Magnificent Seven grouping. And talking of one of the key members of that group now, NVIDIA, and the demand for exposure to that company. We have an NVIDIA ETF chart that shows what's been going on. If you want to be able to double your gains or indeed double your losses with exposure to NVIDIA and this ETF... This is an example of Granite Shares ETF, and you've seen the inflows, net purchases of over half a billion U.S. dollars worth of this ETF. Again, as investors try to get exposure to the upside coming through from NVIDIA. Of course, with the context that in the last two trading sessions, NVIDIA is actually down 11% in the last two trading sessions. Again, this is an ETF that's designed to double the gain or losses of the stock's daily move. And Granite Shares poured in $252 million in fresh capital just last week. $252 million in fresh capital last week. So it's another way that investors are looking to get exposure to, of course, that AI chip maker NVIDIA. Last two sessions down around 11%, but of course upside of over, well over 100% year to date for NVIDIA. Let's move from NVIDIA then to Bitcoin because they have also, we're also talking about records with Bitcoin. 72,000, above 72,000 was the line that it crossed yesterday. And talking of ETFs, this is also partly an ETF story, of course. The ETFs are the likes of Fidelity and others approved by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in January, pulling in the inflows then. And the upside just continues for this cryptocurrency. 72,881 was the level it notched yesterday. A little lower than that today. But again, the split as well will be coming in April, that is expected to put further momentum into this cryptocurrency, up 48% just in the last 30 days. Coming up, inflation in focus as investors count down to that key US CPI print. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. BOJ officials edge closer to raising interest rates. Bloomberg has been told the decision hinges on Friday's initial numbers from spring wage talks. 
Markets in a holding pattern ahead of U.S. inflation data, which could influence the Federal Reserve's next move. And J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warns the U.S. economy is not out of the woods, saying a recession isn't off the table. He adds that the Fed should wait before cutting interest rates. Let's check in on these markets then. A little modest downside coming through for US and European stocks yesterday. Today, the picture is a little brighter as we build up to the wage data out of the UK and of course that CPI print 1.30pm UK time out of the United States. European futures pointed to gains of six tenths of a percent 4,961. UK futures then FTSE 100 futures at 7,727 looking to add 57 points up 7 tenths of a percent so set for a pretty decent session here in the UK the FTSE 100 of course and the wage data later today what that does in terms of the thinking around the Bank of England markets expecting the BOA to cut not until August after the ECB and the Fed does the data out today change that view. S&P futures above 5,200 looking to add four tenths of a percent. Nasdaq futures at 18,326 again after the downside that we saw yesterday pointing higher today six tenths of a percent. Let's flip the board and look cross asset. We've been talking of course about the lines crossing on the Bank of Japan. It is on a knife edge the decision around whether or not to hike for the first time since 2007 in March or April. They're going to do it. It's a question as to whether it comes in March or April. And the wage data on Friday, as we said in the headlines, is going to be really consequential to that thinking. The Japanese yen, softer in the session versus the US dollar, down three tenths of a percent at 147.46. Let's have a little look on the US 10 year then, 409 on the benchmark as we lead up to that inflation print. The expectation is that core inflation in the US will moderate from 3.9% to 3.7% in the print later today, year on year. The pound, 128, one of the best performing currencies year to date. Again, the labor data could move that currency later today. And iron ore, after a drop of almost 7% yesterday, the biggest drop since 2022, you are looking at iron ore at 108 per ton, up 9 tenths of percent so far in the session. And the squeeze came through yesterday on concerns about the lack of fiscal stimulus out of China. Let's get you the latest then in terms of what is happening with the BOJ. Again, Bloomberg reporting according to sources close to the BOJ, that they are going to make this decision, it seems, at the meeting next week. And it is finally balanced in terms of whether they raise interest rates in March at next week's meeting or indeed hold off until April. And there is an expectation that if they do hold off until April, then it will be a hawkish hold. That is one potential scenario for this Bank of Japan. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Jackson then for the reaction and the details. Paul, what have we been hearing? Where does this leave the thinking on the BOJ? Uh, well, I think we have uh, a finely uh, poised uh, decision coming up next week. Uh, there are some officials uh, favouring uh, a March move, uh, thinking they've already seen enough. Uh, the wage data has been coming in strong uh, so far. Uh, we saw those demands from Rengo, that's Japan's biggest union federation, last week, uh, saying that their average demands was 5.85% compared with about four and a half percent a year ago. So much more pressure from the union side for higher wages uh, uh, amid all the talk of the need to raise wages uh, above inflation and uh, really drive uh, this inflation cycle that the BOJ is looking for. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we're hearing that some officials favour waiting till April. I think that's kind of uh, been the, the baseline scenario. That uh, uh, makes a lot of sense, gives the Bank of Japan time to look at uh, more wage data that includes smaller firms, smaller companies. That is a concern uh, amongst officials uh, that, hey, look, you know, the big boys, that the, the big companies, the big exporters, yes, sure, they can give big uh, wage raises. But what about smaller firms that employ the majority of people uh, in Japan? Um, so I guess uh, uh, we've got these figures coming on Friday from Rengo, which is the actual results of those annual wage talks. And if they come in hot, uh, then I think expectations for a March move are really going to uh, uh, get, uh, uh, get a fire lit underneath them. OK, so the, way, the wage negotiation data out, out of Japan on Friday will be the most, the, the most important uh, wage data we've had out of Japan for, for a very long time then. How, how have Awaders comments today? He's been giving testimony again in terms of his views on the economy. What have, we, what have we been hearing from the Bank of Japan governor? How has that informed our views on, on, on the economy and, and the prospects for, for a rate hike? 
Hey, look, I think uh, Governor Ueda's job when he's appearing in Parliament is not to give any signalling mm. about what's about to happen. Mm. Uh, he usually plays it fairly cautiously and reiterates uh, what he's said before. So you'll see that he said that he thought the economy was uh, recovering moderately, he said there are pockets of a weakness in consumption. Hey, he said all of this before, but, you know, mm. with market like, like very hyped up about what's going to happen, uh, I think there's a bit of overreaction to that uh, comment on the... Uh, weak consumption. I think it's all part of what the BOJ is saying. And uh, hey, it's realistic. I mean, the consumption hasn't been great in Japan. Uh, you know, the economy across the board is not going uh, gangbusters. Uh, but there is enough uh, evidence there to suggest the time has come uh, to uh, move away from the negative interest rate. And that's the turning point that we are approaching. Yeah, deeply consequential. Paul Jackson, really appreciate it. On that Bloomberg scoop, joining us, of course, from Japan on the latest and the consideration, of course, of the BOJ, whether they go in March or April, finally balanced. But it seems they are now preparing, finally, for the first hike since 2007. We appreciate it. We are counting down, of course, to the latest inflation data coming out of the US as well. The closely watched numbers will give investors, we hope, they will hope, further clues on the Fed's policy path. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Dan Moss. Dan, uh, does it significantly change the view on the Fed? Is it likely to significantly change the view. The expectation is that core inflation year on year will come in at around 3.7%. How are you thinking about the impact of this inflation data when it lands, potentially with a thump at 1.30 UK time? Well, it would have to be quite a significant thump for this to change the Federal hmm. Reserve's perspective. You know, the central message from Jay Powell last week is what he's really been saying for a couple of months now which is at some point this year, they expect inflation to slow to an extent that they can comfortably reduce interest rates. Uh, that message really hasn't changed. It would have to take a spectacular confluence of circumstances to knock them off that. I might add that PCE, the inflation gauge that the Fed's 2% mm -hmm. target is based around, is significantly lower than that and is headed toward 2%. Yeah, really worth reminding viewers of the key gauge that the Fed focuses on in terms of personal consumption expenditures and how that data print is, is shaping up. Dan, your views then on what we've been hearing from JP Morgan CEO uh, J Jamie Dimon. He seems to be out of consensus when he says uh, a recession is not off, or off the table when it comes to the US. Is this just a cautionary call from, from Jamie Dimon or is there more to read into this? Well, it's certainly cautionary. As you say, a lot of the consensus has moved away from that and did move away from that in the final months of last year. But he's right on one thing. You can have a recession in the US and not necessarily know it until months after it has ended. Recessions in America are decided by an academic panel that is quite disdainful of the 2% GDP <laughs> rule that's employed in the UK Euroland and places like Australia and New Zealand. In that sense, he's not wildly off the money. OK, Bloomberg's Dan Moss with a preview of the inflation data coming out of the US and a view there on what we've been hearing from JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, cautioning that a recession is not off the table, of course, for the US. Thank you very much indeed. Dan, right to the UK now where January jobs data is out in about 30 minutes time, a little under 30 minutes, about 20 minutes time. In fact, the numbers will be closely watched by the Bank of England as it mulls when to cut rates. For a preview on that data set then, let's bring in Bloomberg's Anna Andrade. Anna, what can we expect from the data today? What are you going to be watching for? Hi, good morning. So the data coming out today will be a little bit of an awkward one for the BOE. Um, on the one hand, we still have all these issues going on with a labor force survey that's being distorted by low response rates. And that means that we cannot take a clear signal from the unemployment rate, which has been falling. But the BOE is unlikely to place a lot of weight into that. We are certainly not. And then the second thing, and probably most important, is that after wage growth has been on a sort of fast decline um, in recent months, especially in the latter part of 2020, 
2023, it's the data today is likely to show it uh, that the climate is coming to a halt. Um, so on the whole economy, wage, goes, wage gains are likely to stay unchanged at 6.2%, and the private sector measure is even likely to tick up slightly to 6.3%. Now, the less bad news is that this sort of increase is largely anticipated because it will be driven by base effects and not by acceleration in the monthly pace of wage growth. So overall, the BOE will sort of be able to look through that as well. Okay, so wage data that's going to look relatively sticky, but ultimately priced in, at least some, some, some of it. And how, it, how is it likely to feed into the thinking of the Bank of England then? The last time I checked, the markets were pricing in a cut, not until, not until August for the BOE. So after the ECB, after the Fed, uh, how are you thinking about the reaction function of the BOE to this data? Yeah, so I think, I mean, as long as there's no up, nasty upside surprise in the data, as long as private sector wage growth only ticks up to 6.3% from 6.2%, I think that's still okay. Um, wage growth is running a little bit higher than the BOE had expected in February, but marginally. And we still think that the most important indicator right now is headline inflation, because the BOE has sort of hinted that as long as headline inflation moves and settles at 2%, inflation expectations will adjust and that will fit through lower pay demand. So that's sort of the framework that they're using. And headline inflation is still on track to fall below 2% in the spring. So we think a window to cut rates will open in May. Whether the BOE will take it or not is a different question. Actually, remarks from the chief economist Hugh Peel recently have suggested that it might prefer to wait, so not take that May meeting um, um, as the first one to cut. And we think that June is probably looking um, more likely for the easing cycle to start. OK, really interesting. Bloomberg's Anna Andrade with the analysis there as we look ahead to the wage data out of the UK in a little under 20 minutes time and the expectation that it could be June when the Bank of England goes with its first cut in a long time. Of course, there's plenty more coming up. European futures pointed to gains of six tenths of percent. US futures, S&P Emonies up four tenths of percent. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Happy Tuesday. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Just getting up to speed on what's been happening across the Bank of Japan. Lines crossing a Bloomberg scoop. We have been speaking to sources close to the Bank of Japan and they are getting that much closer to a decision in terms of whether or not to hike interest rates and move out a negative policy for the first time since 2007. It remains on a knife edge as to whether or not they do that in March next week or in April. If they do hold next week, then it could be a hawkish hold. That is one option that officials are weighing up. But crucially, it is the wage negotiation data that will come through this Friday that could move the needle and be consequential to that decision. So we know it is too close to call right now, but there's a consensus. They do need to hike interest rates. The question is, do they do it next week or they do it in April? And again, the wage data, the negotiation data coming through on Friday could be very, very meaningful to that decision. OK, let's switch focus now as we look at the Japanese yen at 147.39, by the way, a little bit softer in the session. Let's go to what's happening at one of the big corporates, of course, that has dominated the agenda for at least the last 12 months or so. In the US, Novo Nordisk's blockbuster weight loss drug, WeGovi, may soon be covered by Medicare for heart disease patients with obesity. That's after regulators expanded approval to include reducing the risk for heart attacks and strokes. The FDA says it's the first time a weight loss therapy has also been approved to help prevent life-threatening cardiovascular events. Soaring sales of Novo Nordisk's obesity drugs helped boost income and investment returns tenfold last year for the owner, Novo Holdings. Total income and returns came in at $4.5 billion. Let's get more then from Bloomberg's Naomi Kresge. Naomi, what do we know about the approval from the FDA? How much of an uplift is this likely to give Novo in the months and quarters ahead? And what are they doing with all this money that they are generating now? So the importance of the FDA approval is really that it um, gives Novo an additional argument to payers that this is not just a medicine for obesity, this is also a medicine for impact on other diseases and cardiovascular disease is, you know, a, a extremely important, um, the biggest killer. Um, and so this is just really key to their um, effort to, to get this medicine used more widely. Um, turning to Novo Holdings, I mean, 
this whole is the holding company that controls 77% of Novo Nordisk, um, and their fortunes have risen, of course, uh, along with the drug maker. What is the competitive threat right now for Novo Nordisk? We know Eli Lilly is ramping up its efforts around its own weight loss drugs. Is there a challenge that comes through, a consequential challenge that comes through for Novo this year? Oh, absolutely. Um, they had the uh, weight loss market really to themselves um, for a couple of years. And now for the first time this year, they're facing competition from Eli Lilly. Um, these two companies have known each other for decades. They've been competitors um, in the diabetes space. Um, and, you know, Lilly is a formidable competitor. We will, we will see um, these two companies kind of duking it out in this area for the next few years. OK, Bloomberg's Naomi Kresge, thank you very much indeed with the analysis coming through. For the implications of Novo Holdings, of course, Novo Nordisk, as they continue to build out their expansion and the market for WeGovy and other weight loss drugs within their portfolio. And I'll be speaking with Novo Holdings CEO Kasim Kutai at 9.30 a.m. London time. So do tune in for that interview. To France now, where June's European elections are being seen by some as a dry run for 2027's presidential race. Marine Le Pen is ahead in the polls with her far-right national rally party building momentum. But is there anything Emmanuel Macron can do to hold back the prospect of a Le Pen presidency? Let's get more then from Bloomberg's Anya Norsbaum in Paris. Anya, why is it crunch time then for Macron? These elections, the general elections for France are not until 2027, but we're looking ahead to June already. Indeed. So as you said, these EU elections are seen as a dry run for Macron. And the polls are showing that Marine Le Pen has been steadily building her popularity. And that's despite Macron always picturing himself as the anti-Le Pen antidote. So now we're going to get a sense of, of whether or not Marine Le Pen can make it in 2027 after years of building up her reputation. Mm. What is the strategy then? What is the Macron, la, the Macron strategy uh, to kind of curtail Le Pen? And what is Le, Pen, what is Le Pen's strategy to win? How has she built out this success, uh, at least so far? If you read our long, long story, this big take until the very end, you'll uh, see that we've done a lot of reporting from Normandy, which is unremarkable in many ways, but remarkable in the sense that it's really average and representative of what could be happening in France. Um, Macron uh, used to be very strong there, used to be the strong, uh, Macron's stronghold. Before that, it was a stronghold of the traditional left and the traditional right. And essentially, Marine Le Pen's party won almost all the seats in this uh, constituency. And now she's trying to build a reputation as a respectable party, uh, you know, with lawmakers that are trying to be, as they say themselves, not at all scary, and trying to normalize mm -hmm. the party that has a history of anti-Semitism and xenophobia. And at the same time, they're trying to stick to the economic issues that a lot of people are complaining about. And there it means caring and talking about the lack of doctors or the fact that a lot of people don't feel that they've, they're reaping the benefits of Macron's pro-business economic reforms. And Macron's response, since you asked, is that he's being uh, very aggressive these days and picturing the EU elections of June as an existential fight against the far right and a fight for the EU against uh, Russia and to support Ukraine against Russia. And that is because he's uh, picturing Le Pen as uh, essentially an ally of uh, Vladimir Putin who could uh, tilt the war in favor um, of the Russian president. Well, all of that may sound familiar to those who tuned in for the State of the Union address from, from President Biden when he was referring, of course, to his challenger uh, in President Trump. So that's interesting in terms of the read across from the US to France on some of these similar challenges. If, 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 is Macron guaranteed to run again in 2027? Is that, is that locked in? That's actually the crux of the matter. Macron cannot run for a third consecutive mandate in 2027. So this means that he has to appoint a successor. And Macron is known not to be a great manager. He has failed so far to groom anyone. There are a few people who are emerging. His prime minister, 35-year-old Gabriel Attal, uh, his former prime minister, Edouard Philippe, but none of them so far uh, really has uh, imposed himself or herself as the next uh, possible uh, successor of Macron. OK, Bloomberg's Anya Norsbaugh on that Bloomberg big take around Le Pen and Macron. Well worth a read. Thank you very much indeed. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Happy Tuesday. The Bloomberg scoop at the moment is around the Bank of Japan and the decision as to when to hike for the first time since 2007. And it does remain on a knife edge. Too close to call. They are coming round to the view that they do need to hike. That's going to happen. It's the question as to whether it happens next week at the March meeting or if they hold off until April. And the wage negotiation detail that comes through on Friday out of Japan, going to be really, really consequential in terms of where they land on this decision. And if they hold next week, they are looking at the option of coming through with a hawkish hold, flagging a hike at the next meeting. So again, the debate is very, very finely balanced, and there will be great scrutiny then on that wage negotiation detail that comes through on Friday. The Japanese yen, though, under pressure in the session so far today, just down three-tenths of percent, but after the strength that we've seen, of course, in the last few weeks, 147.43 on the Japanese yen intraday. Now, let's have a quick look in terms of how things are shaping up. The preview of the inflation data out of the U.S., dropping at 1.30 p.m. U.K. time, of course. Before we get to the overhead lines, we've got to have a quick look. Before I move on to the CPI out of the U.S., we're looking at this chart in terms of where the BOJ rates are, of course, in negative territory, so that they move them out of the negative territory. That will happen. The question is, do they go in March or in April? And that's the context historically in terms of where rates are, negative rates in Japan, and that's likely to end in the next couple of months. Again, let's move on to the U.S. inflation story now, because I do want to touch on what's going on there. And the expectations coming through from this Fed survey, the New York Fed survey, and this is interesting, potentially concerning for the Fed, because consumer expectations actually tick up in terms of inflation in February. They dropped in January quite significantly, but you can see the tick up there with the yellow line, and that potentially is a fly in the ointment as overall inflation has been grinding lower in the US. But consumer price expectations ticking up in February will be a concern for this Federal Reserve. Let's flip the board and have a look at the expectations broadly in terms of where inflation is likely to land on a segment-by-segment segment basis. And you can see it's moved from durable goods, a lot of work being done in terms of durable goods prices and inflation there, and that is essentially not a problem anymore. It is all about services. As you can see in the white bars, that is the services part of the inflation basket, and that's where the work needs to be done. Again, on the core basis, year-on-year, year, inflation is expected to come in at 3.7% down from 3.9%. But look for the services component, so essential. Still ahead, I'm going to be speaking to the Generali CEO and Managing Director, Philip Dornay, on earnings next hour. Plus, Novo Holdings CEO, Kassim Kutte, joins The Pulse, 9.30 a.m. London time. Stay with us. Markets Today is next. This is Bloomberg. 